itself has really tightened up and got really strong. And we're, we ourselves are, are transitioning into other opportunities. And so just, uh, just to finish up, we are now opening up uh, satellite food banks. So, so our first satellite food bank will be in Streetsville. Mm -hmm. And it'll be basically we parachute into a, a, another uh, social services group it's a venue and then we leave with, without any trace. It's kind of like camping in national parks, right? Come in and you're not supposed to leave a trace. That's what we're doing here. I prefer um, to think of it more of as the bat as the Batman model. Uh, you show up, <laughs> you do some good, you take off instead of illegally camping. Uh, but wow! <laughs> so, so who are you partnering with in Streetsville? So Streetsville is going to be Streetsville United Church. Great. Um, but we're also looking at this year. We are hoping to open about four to six different satellite food banks. So we're actually looking at going into Peel as, as well, the region of Peel. Um, the other aspect is that we are actually developing the Meals on Wheels program for South Asian community and for the halal required community. And so we're working on partnering, trying to find partnerships for, for that as well. Um, because that's just, there's a lot, a large segment of people that aren't being served fully. And we can, we can do that. We've been running the Meals on Wheels for two years. So that's what we're doing is looking at how do we, we partner with other organizations that have a shared mandate? Maybe they don't have the same mandate, they have shared aspects. So like this week, we're working with Vita Center. Mm -hmm. um, and for the next 30 weeks, we're providing a fresh produce box for the, the low income families of the Vita Center, where we go down to the Ontario Food Terminal, buy all the produce, put together the boxes, and then they distribute it to their folks. Wow, their Peter, folks. I gotta tell you, that's, that, that, that's amazing on about 14 different levels, and I haven't figured out which ones would be where. <laughs> I, I think yeah. we could, we, you know, I, I got to suggest to the, uh, my, my friends at the Community Foundation that we uh, consider having you <laughs> on, on your own show talking about this stuff. And by the way, when it comes to partnering around South Asian food for, for seniors, uh, count us in. Uh, we that was one of the, the the media stories that we were able to break earlier this year that Meals on Wheels wasn't able to serve the South Asian community. Uh, so, kudos uh, again. Like I said, fourteen different areas. I, I, I'm I'm going to move on if I can yep. uh, to 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 ask uh, Renee um, a, a question around uh, how has the pandemic impacted your fundraising efforts? Uh, it, I mean, we all we use pivot unprecedented. You're on mute. There, there are some things in there, but honestly, fundraising when you can't go to a gala or an event, I, 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 I I'm, I'm stuck. How, how, how did you cope, Renee? Uh, that's a great question, and certainly um, we have so many of these key words, the pivot and, and all that. I like to use the word adapt. I'm trying to change some of my terminology and not say pivot as much, but we all know we're going to use it. Um, this pandemic's been a whirlwind for us at Peel Children's Aid Foundation. So one of the things I've learned and certainly my team's learned is that we all need help at some point in our lives, whether we give or we receive, it's we're all bringing value to the community. So everybody here today is bringing a lot of value to the community. And I've seen so many silver linings and I've watched people step up and do things that maybe they've never done before. And I think that's been a huge uh, trigger for all of us as people are doing if they can and they're really stepping up. And many of the people on this call today have done extraordinary work. And I'm humbled to be sitting here and, and being part of this. Um, so for Peel Children's Aid Foundation, many things have happened, but one of the things that certainly came prevalent very quickly was a quote. And it sounds really simple. Um, that stuck with us, um, my dear uh, colleague uh, Patricia brought forward was Mr. Rogers um, said, when I was a boy, I would see scary things on in the news and we see that every day. Uh, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers, you will always find the helpers in the community. We have so many helpers and we're very blessed. So we've been able to quickly change directions and create new and innovative strategies. We saw demand and capacity was huge for us. So the demand increased by, as Peter was mentioning, and by the way, Peter, I can't wait to talk to you offline about opportunities, but we saw the 30% um, increase in um, requests from our community. We, as you know, support the most vulnerable children and youth and families um, in Peel and specifically in Mississauga. We're so lucky to have support uh, from the Community Foundation of Mississauga because we are considered essential service. We're front lines. That's been a huge 
plus for us and very it's been very um, helpful in receiving emergency funding. So we as a team knew right away we had to go after every emergency fund that was out there. Um, and we were very fortunate and very lucky. Um, but the other challenges we saw was we were hit hard on dependent income. Dependent income for us is signature events. So we had an event in May, we have an event in uh, November, and those events um, are a huge source of revenue for us in terms of our operating and our programs and the services that we offer. So although we've seen a drop in that, we've been able to um, adapt very quickly and create um, virtual online events. And I think we, we did that um, right in June, May and June, we did that right away. So that was a huge piece. Um, lost revenue means that we had to restructure our team. Uh, we've also seen in the community, probably many of you have too, is corporate funders and foundational funders are pivoting their focus as well. They're looking at um, COVID-19 emergency funds, which is fantastic. And that's been very, very supportive for us. However, what we see is it does take money away from key programs and services that we do offer in the community. So we haven't, that's been a bit of a, a difficult piece for us. So we have had to create an emergency fund, which we did, and we were very successful. We've also had to take our programs and services, as Peter alluded to, and do curbside delivery. Um, so we have a distribution center in our new building. We do have a new building. So we moved during all of this as well, um, Peel Children's Aid. And the curbside delivery for our families in the community has been key. Also virtual programs for all of our youth, but lastly, the virtual events. And it's been helpful to collaborate. I think the key word here is collaboration. Um, our team thrives on collaboration and we've been able to have an approach with all different community members uh, many here on this call today and we're very reliant on uh, things like that so we were struck that we had to pivot quickly we had to change the way we do things we also now are looking at a new um, strategic focus and fundraising program so we're going to have a new plan in place the other piece that is really critical i think is sometimes we forget the health and wellness component so we know that our team and our teams, um, uh, there's a lot of change going on all around us. So we have to make sure that as we adapt, we're also doing a health and wellness component for our teams and the people around us. So we've done that and we're implementing the strategy, um, which will really change the way we do things. Um, but we also have to consult with our board. We have a very engaged and strategic board, um, but as everybody's sort of pulled in all these different directions, we just have to make sure that I think that we're always collaborating with everyone in the community. If we're not, we're not going to be able to stay on the forefront. Um, a year from now, we're all going to see a lot of changes. We're going to see that the emergency funds aren't available as much and things aren't as available. So we have to make sure that we put plans in place right now and strategy that we're ready for it when it comes. So it's been an exciting time. We've been very fortunate and uh, our team just feels blessed that people are still supporting our families. As you can imagine, our youth are already on, um, many of our youth are already struggling. So the pandemic has um, certainly put them in a very precarious position. Wow, yes. Renee, um, okay, again, a, a, <laughs> an amazing collection of things, right? Uh, but what I particularly draw on is, 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 is the aspect of caring for the carer, uh, that is caring for the staff person that, that is trying to support a family or, or uh, and the, the, the importance of, of that, you know, within the charitable sector. We, we, we are natural, if you will, givers, right? So that this time it becomes, when it becomes harder to give is when we need you to give more. Um, and and, and, and yeah, that, exactly. that feels horribly unfair, but uh, is, is the nature of the beast. And somehow, you, you, you sort of alluded to that the people are able to draw on that tapped energy to realize that, you know what, we have to up our game. So, so do you have any other examples of how you cared for staff or, or, or you were able to, to support staff as they, as they pivoted, collaborated and did all the things that we, we, we've been expected to do? Well, I think it's critical to um, be there for each other and, and just say, 
it comes down to if you're having a bad day, you're having a bad day. Things are going on all around us. So we have what we call Friday fun days. Um, we haven't always been able to do it because sometimes we're, but we try to do some fun things. We talk about what's um, what we're most grateful for, what we're not, what's most challenging for us. Just having that one-on-one -on -one connection. And I know Zoom's not always the best way, but making sure that we're still celebrating the little wins, I think that's critical. We've had a lot of success. And as I said, Silver Linings has been have been huge for us. We've um, seen some incredible things from incredible people. And I think we feed off of that. So I think as a team, we feed off of that success and success breeds success. So we want to make sure that we're always talking about the positive things. I, I know I drive my team crazy because I'm always talking about silver linings, but, but I might be having a bad day and they would say, what's going on? Like, let's just talk about it. Let's just talk about what's negative, but let's always bring a positive to the table. And I think mm -hmm. that's really critical for um, these difficult times. It, it's, it's not easy for anybody. And I commend everybody that's on this call today. Um, you're doing incredible work. Well, Renee, thank you for that. Um, but but I, I do I also draw from it the, the idea of Fun Fridays and the idea that, that uh, you know what, let's see if we can use the tool to do something that's non-official, non-work. Uh, many people have zipped over to this meeting after having had another meeting, may even have one after this, um, uh, even though the fridge is closer than it used to be for, for, for most of us. Um, <laughs> Don't we, talk about that. Yeah, well, <laughs> and then sitting all day isn't helping at all, right? So so <laughs> it, it, it's great though, because another part of that silver lining is giving each other a break, understanding that, you know what, this is suboptimal. This is not, we did not get into this field. We got in this field because we're people, people who like interacting with people and two dimensions is better than none, but it really, it, it's not the same. Um, I can only imagine what our first collection of community meetings will be like as, as COVID begins to pass. Uh, and I do look yeah. forward to the day of, uh, racing every one of you back to the, the, the back of the next community foundation meeting uh, to, to, to grab a coffee and a cookie, um, but, uh, and then chat with you. So, so thank you, Renee, for, for um, helping expose uh, so, so much of that. Um, and this, you're next, Anis. So, so I, I've got a question for you, and that is, how have you felt the community's uh, need, the need in the community has changed since March of last year? From, from a, the Visual Arts Mississauga perspective, how has the need changed? Um, well, I'm not sure the original need has actually changed. I said uh, we, we support a lot of um, what I call wellness and mental health initiatives. People take up art and creativity to give themselves an outlet for their, for their energy to find a nice support network and a community creative community to work in. So I don't think the needs changed in that time. Our ability to uh, reach out and try and to continue to engage with our community is what had to change, obviously. Um, and back to Peter's comment about pivoting, we, we also had to do that. We were right, ready to start March break camp and that fell by the wayside. So we had about two weeks to shift our spring program uh, to online. But other challenge was actually um, working with our artist instructor team to help them become comfortable with teaching online. So there was a bit of a technology gap um, for many people uh, in their ability to deliver a program online and people's ability to then access it. So we were very fortunate to um, connect with um, a couple of professionals that one of our artists who had been trained to teach online. So we were able to offer our instructors a two week training or six weeks, sorry, training program to help them feel confident to get online. Um, and by the summer, we increased our online offerings. And by fall, we actually had some courses back on at BAM and online. And um, I think, you know, continuing to find ways to support the Community Foundation was critical to us because a lot of the groups um, that we've been supporting through our outreach plan, particularly youth through the school programs, we no longer had access to in the same way. So uh, we received a grant to offer our youth programming 
to the youth centers that were still operating. Um, so the Dam and uh, Dixie Blurview Boys and Girls Club. So we created um, some programs, uh, free offerings for their constituents to um, offer art making courses online for them. And we delivered supplies. So back to, again, coming up with curbside pickup um, for parents too, there was no camp offering. So we've been adapting our program for parents and again, collecting supplies and having them available for curbside pickup. So we, we said at the beginning, um, we were in a, in a wonderful position as a not-for-profit in that up until March, we generated about 75 to 80% of our own revenue through our products and services, which then came to a screeching halt in March. Um, so certainly the grants um, that we received, the emergency funding, which allowed us not only to continue the programming, but also allowed us to keep our artists instructors who have precarious work at the best um, employed. So that was a fantastic opportunity for us. And um, back to Renee's uh, point about board support. I think you can't ever, it was, you know, for boards for not-for-profit, this was a really challenging time because you don't know what's going to happen and how's the funding going to continue and the modeling. And I, I can't say enough about um, the VAM board, who was cautious and concerned for sure, but was also very, very supportive and, um, you know, came to bat for us over and over again. So, yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, Anna, that speaks to, and those are volunteers, right? The, the, our board members are volunteers, yeah, dedicated people for the community who, in each of their own lives, uh, your working lives had to change things, the personal lives had to change things. Um, but I, I too didn't see any drop off in enthusiasm from our board. Um, uh, and that lifeblood needs to be recognized, I think. Uh, uh, there has to be a way to recognize. I know we always appreciate, appreciate our volunteers, but we normally don't put them through this kind of a ringer uh, and then still expect yes. <laughs> them to, to, to be able to support staff so then we can go through our own, you know, uh, evolution and figure out how we're going to do this. Where do we go from here? So that, that's, uh, that, that's fascinating. And, and thank you for raising those, those, those points. Um, th th does anyone else see uh, on the panel um, uh, a change in, in the need of the community? I, I, I imagine with the economic pieces, Peter's pointed out that the, the, there was a, an uptick in need. Uh, any comment there, Peter? Yeah, so we, you know, traditionally food banks have always served the kind of the, the lowest income of the lowest incomes. Um, but now you had, we had a large population of people that have never used the food bank uh, con contacting us. I actually had, the what this past summer, we had a teacher who, um, she was in tears. She said she always had been part of her classes doing fundraising and food drives for the food bank. And now she had to use the food bank, right? We have to understand that in, in Canada society, the need for using a food bank isn't based on your income. It's based on, you know, what you need. And so uh, we've really changed our focus on that. People need food and people are valuable. And that's really the, the, the core thing here is that you can't judge people on their incomes or on, on, on uh, you know, even their jobs or anything because their needs are are based on, you know, when they're working and everything else. And when things get taken away, we're just seeing, we're seeing people that are so afraid to come to the food bank because both they're embarrassed, but also they've never experienced it. And they always say, and a very common Canadian habit is that we always think that there's somebody else that's worse off than us. And so we don't want to take advantage of an opportunity to be supported because we think others need it more than us. But you, you yeah. finding a way to destigmatize that that help, um, I, I, I think is there's lots of lessons there for 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 uh, all of us. Uh, one of my silver linings, to to use Renee's phrase, uh, it was uh, the opportunity to see a senior uh, come on um, line for the first time. So, and I have to thank our volunteers and our staff because uh, mm -hmm. uh, that we got a donation of tablets through Rogers mm -hmm. and then those tablets uh, were, were then were reprogrammed and distributed. And 
the one of the highlights was, and, and don't forget, you, you have to explain to a senior how to use a device they haven't used using the phone as opposed right. to, let me do that for you. Yeah. And then they do it <laughs> and then you connect with them. But one of the, the highlight was watching them light up as they saw each other uh, on screen, they hadn't seen each other for so long, and that, uh, that, that and that, this was earlier days. Um, but connecting, and I've connected since, and have uh, done art because I've seen the photographs of the, uh, the seniors standing next to their proud painting that they were able to put together with the help of a local artist, and then come back. So there, there has been uh, digging down to find a strength. Uh, in, in each of our areas and in so many others that, that I think has been amazing. So th this is uh, an opportunity and then a wonderful reaffirmations in the chat and, 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 and other pieces in there, including uh, an opportunity to get AV equipment. So there's some neat things <laughs> happening in, in, in the chat for everyone. But what I'd like to have now is more of a Q&A opportunity. So um, our, our many community builders that are out there from organizations all over the region, all over the city uh, and, and beyond to please um, if you've got a question, add into the question. If there was one, a question put in there earlier, I may have missed it in the scroll uh, as I was listening intently. Uh, please feel free to, to cut and paste and put it back in. Um, so uh, as, as they're doing that, I'm going to ask uh, uh, the panel, uh, has your organization experienced any other challenges, uh, such as uh, difficulties ac accessing special funds? Uh, Renee did mention uh, um, applying to, to, to all, all, all these uh, opportunities that popped up. Uh, was there any difficulty in, in, in accessing special funds during this? Uh, uh, Renee, did, did, did you feel any challenges uh, uh, as you applied, as your team applied for things? I I think the biggest challenge was um, is, is making sure we could is uh, again with, uh, with a staff of three is making sure that we could apply, <laughs> but we did. And, and I think it was also not being, I think fundraising is a very difficult thing for people. If they're not, if it's not their norm for me, it's, it's been most of my life. So for me, it's the norm, but I think it's just going for it, like getting out there and saying, we need to help these people. Like Peter mentioned, we're all this close to being that person. We could, and it could be any one of us at any given point could be one of those people that we're supporting. And we all know that. I think we innately know that. So know that you're not asking for yourself. You're asking for people in the community and we all have 30 to 40% increases. We're seeing a huge increase in domestic violence and, and child abuse. So, so we know that we have to do it. So we're applying to everything, but making sure that you have the right ask is really, really critical. That makes that makes make good sense. Annis, did you want to add to that? Um, and that you're not just blindly asking. You have to really put a lot of thought. Then, yeah. Whoops. Um, okay, so there was a question. I agree. Go ahead, Annis. I think I froze no, I a little. Agree Sorry, with guys. <laughs> We'll say to the to many of the funding organizations, the quickness of getting funding opportunities up and available um, was really wonderful. And for most of the organizations, not all, but for most of them, the applications were relatively um, easy compared to some of the other ones. So there wasn't, and and you heard quickly. You know, you you heard about the results quickly. So if you didn't get something, you could keep that that, that uh, incentive going to find something else. So certainly the community foundations, um, opportunities and emergency funding and special funding was amazing, was amazing. And, but the other grants through the federal government and uh, the provincial government has been really, really helpful. To Renee's point, how long all of this lasts is um, in question. And so certainly the uh, changes that we've made, it's gonna be interesting to see the ones that we're gonna keep to Peter's point of people, you know, suddenly realizing they'd rather show up and pick up their hand or who's to shopping and things like that. So um, I think if many of these things we would have never tried 
if we hadn't been in this position, we'd been talking about it, maybe this is a good idea. But I think um, I call them, we spoke about this earlier, a COVID gift, where we were forced to try things and then suddenly had the wonderful realization, wow, this is great and it really works. And it's pushing us very quickly into another uh, level of opportunity to support and engage our clientele. Yeah, and it's going to be fascinating to see, you're right, what we're going to keep, uh, what is going to change. I, I, I do think that, uh, like I, I mentioned, that we're people-oriented people, that we are going to want to be in the office, but are we learned that we don't have to be in the office as often. Yeah. And, and, and uh, um, uh, our, our, our transportation line, if you will, uh, paying for gas for people to go to meetings or meeting clients or that sort of thing, that's that has necessarily uh, hasn't been touched, uh, but then our IT costs went up too. So, so maybe it turns into telecommunications and and travel are now become the same thing. It's getting there, and and half the time, if not more, uh, these days, all the time, we get there virtually, and, and so we'll see how how, how that works. Um, I have to uh, a shout out to to Eddie who asked the question, um, what. Uh, you know, how do I, uh, where do we find a list of emergency funding that uh, that's available to charities? And uh, Leslie Page for heroic, wow, the response, federal, uh, provincial, and, and other bits in there uh, as to how one can apply uh, for supports. Uh, I know the Community Foundation has been involved with that, uh, as has um, other uh, charities and uh, the United Way and uh, the Region Appeal in helping flow emergency dollars. Um, so that that they, there has been, and I would assume will continue to be opportunities to support organizations as we all change how we do things uh, and, and and continue. But it does put a burden of paperwork and application on an organization, uh, at, 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 but not too bad. To be frank, our smallest application was the most complicated one that we had to apply for, <laughs> and the larger yeah, yeah. ones were easier. And it's kind of like it, everyone's been very generous, so people have been very supportive. Exactly. Like, yeah, I don't think it's been too onerous because they know that we're trying to write. There's a lot of writing going along here, so we have to make sure we get them out. But people have been like the Community Foundation in Mississauga has just been incredible, so we're very, very lucky. Yeah, no, we are. We are lucky, yeah. uh, and recognizing that, and then uh, re-energizing and going on it would, it, it is always uh, a really good thing. I don't see any questions in the chat from from um, the uh, seventy or so people that are in in, in the meeting. Um, so I, again, another invitation. If there's a question that you have for any one or all the panel, uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to ask, and I'll start with Peter, and then I'll move to Annis uh, on the. Um, issue of collaboration. What has partnership meant to your response during COVID-19? Um, so what does partnership meant to you, Peter, uh, and, uh, as we've, we've, we've traveled together in the last year? Well, I think the partnership for, for us, I mean, we're part of the food bank, the network in, in Mississauga, and I think it's really dropped a lot of the barriers or the protectionist uh, <laughs> the situation that we saw amongst uh, other organizations and made it that like for, for me I've always developed things around the idea of sharing resources okay and a lot of people don't get that uh, but now I think they're more keen to share resources because they see that you know maybe we're not both a food bank maybe somebody's the food bank and somebody's a, a child services uh, but we both want to serve similar people and being able to say, hey, you've got, like for me, just an example, you've got a, a room, an office that you don't use uh, Monday to Friday from five o'clock to seven in the evening. Can we run a food bank out of that? Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, you know, I'm running a class that, that on nutrition for new moms. You know, how can you help us, right? And so, so no, but we're seeing that that being sharing resources is able to spread the dollar further, but also um, it, it strengthens the whole community. And and uh, and and I think that's just I've been amazed on how many organizations who have come out of the seemingly, from my perspective, out of the woodwork to come help us. 
Yes, right. I actually in conversations with the staff uh, 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 with Anne Marie uh, at the Community Foundation of Mississauga, they, they, uh, when blanket calls went out for potential support, um, organizations that, that we neither have, of us had bumped into uh, um, uh, applied. So there was a great opportunity for us to learn what else is happening in, in our vibrant community. Anna, uh, did, how, how did uh, partnership impact you? And then I'll go to the chat for some piling up questions. I think they've given us, you know, a greater opportunity. I've, I've always believed in collaboration and to Peter's point about sharing resources and people, um, you know, in the past, there's been some re resistance to that, but I think COVID has certainly propelled us to the point where collaboration and are, are mandatory for the success of every organization. Um, it, and more importantly, for the ability to serve the, the population of Mississauga, when, um, there's so many, everybody's doing so much good work and finding ways to, A, not reinvent the wheel, but to build on the strengths of each organization and dovetail them together is, is going to be a really exciting future goal, I think. Fabulous. Well, well, well said. Uh, Renee, uh, how, how, did, how did partnership, how did that figure in to, to your recent response? Uh, for us, it's been everything. We've always, collaboration's always been key for us to be able to uh, do what we do every day. So this has really propelled that. So COVID and all the things that go on. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think one of the things is sometimes out in the not-for-profit community, we see everybody's got all these pop-ups that we don't need to do that. There's lots of groups doing great work, like Peter, for example. I don't need to be a food bank because we have all of that. So our families and our supports can go to Peter at Eden Food Bank so or Eden Food for Change. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but we all have to collaborate and realize, like Peter said, that we can do things and share. Sharing skills and knowledge is critical. Um, and I learned that way back in my RBC days. But but sharing skills and knowledge is critical. That's really, really important. No, that, that's and more wise words. This is fantastic. So what the first question that I, I'm going to pose out, I'm going to share it uh, amongst the three. We're looking for what the top three needs are in 2021. So looking forward, as opposed to what we've uh, been through and <laughs> trying to recover from, um, what are the top three needs in 2021 from each organization? So I'll ask you for one need. And totally understand that, it, that you know you've, you've not had a bucket of time to think this through. Um, Renee, are, are you comfortable going, going first for that? Uh, so, what would be a major need in 2021 going ahead? And then I'll go to Ines uh, and then to Peter. Uh, I, I guess the need is in terms of what our families need, and our families need um, uh, patience with us in terms of um, support. So. Funding, funding is key, but because then we can offer other things, but we're seeing really the major need is to collaborate. So that's the key word today, I think, um, is to collaborate with other groups. So our major need is, is looking for funding to make sure that we don't, because I really have to say a year from now, things are going to look very different in the fundraising world. Um, and we have to be ready for it. So I, I say that not to be negative, but just no. to say we have to be ready for it. Hey, it's a need, um, it's identified, it's, it's what's yeah, coming. So on funding is critical. Here. Funding is critical for organizations like ours, um, Annis and Peter and myself, um, because we have to be able to continue to support the 30 and 40% increase in need. Yeah, no, well, agreed. Yeah. Uh, Peter, what do you see at, at, uh, off in the distance as, you, as we travel on this journey? Well, I mean, the big thing for for us and and in this uh, this this area is that there's a lot of needs and there's lots of people trying to do little things in little corners. But if we can pull people to get pull it all together and and create continuity amongst the services at at the different levels. So for us, we're looking at you know our need for the next year is looking at where can we expand so that we can support the have a con contiguous uh, support network throughout the region of Peel um, so that everybody that's in need is served at the same level and with the same quality. Um, I mean, my history, I'm all about quality. It's not just about quantity. It's about, for me, it's about quality. And so being able to, to do nutritious food and expand into to making sure people, we meet people where they're at 
Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it's an old saying, but it, it really is for us. It's really important that we look at what's the composition of Mississauga and in the region of Peel, how do we serve them at the level that they need to be served, not at the way we want to serve them. Gotcha. Right? And so that's, uh, we're looking at that. We're also, we know, just like Renee is saying, you know, the funding is not always going to be there. Uh, and, and let's face it, food banks aren't sexy. So where, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff. So we, we work, operate on a sustainability model. So we recognize that we do have, we have funding opportunities and donation opportunities, but my background's business. And so how do you develop a business strategy that allows us to be sustainable? And so like with our Meals on Wheels and things like that, uh, that that's a real big thing for us is creating a sustainability model as we go through and beyond funding, because, you know, most funders are, are gracious enough to help us get things up onto our feet. How do we take that and make that useful? If we really believe in something at the beginning, hopefully we can create it that it's believable further on and, and being able to, for us, be sustainable. So that's a big thing for us. Sustainability, the, the, the takeaway word. Before I go to Annis with her piece, I, I, I'd ask Peter and Renee to have a look in the chat to see if they can pick one of the 11 or 12 <laughs> questions that have appeared, and then I'll get you to choose which question, and then and we'll move on from there. But Annis, what, 2021, here we're going. We're driving here. It's January. It's still Happy New Year time. Almost gone. What well, do you see as, yeah. a, as a, a priority or a, or a big thing ahead? Um, well, you know, certainly for us to be getting back to some in-person uh, programming and contact, just in general, just like you said, going to get the coffee and cookie, having the, the hugs, the physicality of presence of people, um, I, I really would love to see that happen before the end of 2021. I think it's critical to everybody's mental health and wellness and also to the building of the collaborations because, um, you know, we, uh, we were on the Peel Leadership Group together and there was very different meetings when we were together and when we were uh, on Zoom. And so I would like to see that happen. That would be a need. And then beyond funding, to Peter's point, sustainability, because I think the world is going to be very different. So now in, the, in, a, in an experimental phase where we're trying new things and we're really working quickly and hard to address the needs of our clientele. Um, but those needs will probably change and the world's going to be it's all going to, like the puzzle kind of got all separated and now we got to try and start putting the pieces back together and we're Humpty not quite Dumpty. sure yet. <laughs> Yeah. Humpty Dumpty is harder to put together, but I think I like a puzzle better because I think well, we do the, put it. Yeah. Yeah. If the four of us were working, we could we yeah. could get that puzzle done. That's right. <laughs> so, Renee, um, th yeah. thank you, Vanessa. Yeah. Uh, Renee, would uh, did you uh, grab a question out of the chat that you want? Oh, to be sorry. To, oh my goodness. Okay, let's go to Peter then, and then give you a chance to do that. Thank uh, Peter, you. what what question did you grab? Um, I, I just grabbed the ones that there was a couple there about volunteers in us. Okay. Um, so we've always had, we've, I mean, like every uh, organization, we've always depended on our volunteers. We've always had a great pool of volunteers um, and always had a waiting list actually. So during COVID we've lost, because we have a lot of seniors, uh, we've ha lost a lot that have just not been able to come out because uh, just for various reasons. Um, our, our core, a lot of our volunteers are now almost committing full-time hours with us mm -hmm. and they, they like being the, here and, and that we have, I've really integrated the, the staff and the volunteers together as, uh, like I say, self-managed teams. It's really uh, an important thing is that I've got volunteers that have expertise that I could never afford to hire, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, that's what we do here. We've got about 150 regular volunteers each, each week that are a part of that. We've got about 200 on our wait list. Um, and it's really how we've actually taken a volunteer that we had for 10 years and I hired her as the food bank manager now, right? You, you got instant buy-in from everybody. Yep. She knows exactly what's going on and she's able to lead like nobody's business because she's passionate about it. And, and, you know, everybody knows that passionate people are the best ones to lead because it's really easy. 
yeah, yeah, no, a, a, a completely yeah. valuable. Thank you, Renee. Is there a question that you you were able to find and, and with a quick I answer? Did, I did. Really close to the end of our time together. It's a big one. So yeah. it says, I think. It's, <laughs> Because yeah, I think collaboration it. is always important, but in this landscape, the sector also needs to face the difficult conversation around some organizations merging where they're fundamentally the same. So thoughts, my thoughts are very, that's a really good question. Because during these times, sometimes what I say is, Anis mentioned this earlier, is we're forced to change very quickly. So sometimes this is the time to make new inroads and to make changes. So it is going to be very difficult. And I think people do become... Um, very territorial in those types of things, but I think now's the time to make changes. Some organizations might be able to collaborate and then realize, oh, you're already doing that? Well, then I can do this. So like, I wouldn't ever want to, we had a, we, an example is we had a food cupboard at our old location um, for emergencies. We have a lot of families that within an hour need food. Like it's, it's a extreme emergencies. So for me now, we're re-looking at that in our new building so why would we necessarily do that when that's not really our area of expertise? We're not, that's not our area of expertise. So if it's not your area of expertise, you need to go where it is. So I would look to go to Peter to say, okay, this is your area of expertise. How can you help us? And how can we come together? They are very difficult conversations and they're mm -hmm. not easy. But if you engage the right stakeholders, I think it can be a very, um, very collaborative approach. It doesn't have to be a negative. That's, that's really wise. Thank you, Renee. Uh, Annis, were you able to pick out a question? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you know what? I would just like to, to continue on that because I, I think it's really the partnership and mergers, they're going to be um, perhaps some smaller organizations that were doing really great work that aren't going to survive. And um, which is, you know, unfortunate. And starting now before that happens to find ways to yes. collaborate with other organizations to build together uh, a stronger foundation is key. And um, it's a little, you know, it is thinking outside the box, the way the funders work, each organization is separately and you got to come up with your own ideas and projects. But I see a lot of benefit going forward to having organizations um, find ways to merge together. Fantastic, thank you. Wow, uh, we have uh, just about a minute left. Uh, just so you all know, your questions will be captured uh, from, from the chat, so then that'll help inform future conversations. Thank you all for joining us today for vital conversations in COVID-19 times, key learnings from the charitable sector. Um, thanks to our sponsor, Leith Wheeler, and our host, the Community Foundation of Mississauga. Um, and, and thank you so much to our panel. You've been amazing. Uh, Annis, uh, Peter, and Renee, uh, thank you for sharing so openly uh, your learnings, etc. cetera. Um, it, it really helps validate the tremendous work that each of us, uh, all of us on the call, uh, have been doing to help build our, uh, our city. Uh, remember to save the date for our next two sessions uh, uh, in our series, Vital Conversations in COVID-19 Times. Uh, the next one's February 23rd, Cultivating the Conditions for a Thriving Charitable Sector Beyond COVID. And I think some of the questions uh, that we saw today will help build that. That'll be on February 23rd. And then on March 30th, uh, uh, from 11 to 12, we will be, uh, let's talk about employment and underemployment. Uh, and that'll be in interesting because we'll be getting into spring and getting into the concept of building back better. So, so thank you everyone for attending today. We've just hit noon. Uh, please be well and take care uh, and stay uh, supportive of each other and keep doing the amazing work you're doing for our, our, our city, for our region and for all our people. Thank you all. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Gertrude. We'll you, you were soon. great. Thank you, Gertrude. You were amazing.